everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for another night of instructor presentations. Tonight is rather historic. I want you all to know there are those in the audience here in person and we're also broadcasting it live on Zoom as well. So if there's any technical difficulties, which there will be none, please be patient with me. <laughs> all right, so for those of you who if this is your first time present, um, being here this for this evening, here's how the evening goes. Um, our visiting instructors take turns giving 10 minute presentations about their work and themselves. And it's a really fun casual night. If you need bug spray, help yourself. The restroom is open in the dining hall if you need it. And we have six instructors tonight, so I wanna get started. We're gonna get started with our blacksmithing instructor, Wayne Apgar, and our assistant, Sean Fitzsimmons, will be introducing him. Thank you, Rachel. As you know, I'm Sean Fitzsimmons, the assistant of the blacksmithing shop, here to introduce Wayne Apgar. Wayne Apgar is the founder of Durham Forge in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. He's got 25 years of uh, blacksmithing experience. Started over at Touchstone Center for Crafts, but worked his way to Peters Valley. He settled under, under uh, Bob Becker, famous smith, he was recently featured in Elucidator magazine for a piece he did a, a nice guitar, which I'm sure you'll see the pictures of. He's a music lover, a father to feral cats. Uh, people of Peters Valley, I give you Wayne the Wizard Apgar. Well, thank you, Sean. I don't know how I'm going to follow up with that. But uh, anyhow, what I'm going to do tonight instead of pictures, I think it would be nice if I explain a couple pieces that I've made over the years. Dr. Bob Becker taught me how to make this piece um, and some other gentleman taught him. I think the guy's name was John Brown, but I'm not positive. But anyhow, this is what we call a leaf trivet. It's three pieces put together to form a circle. And I'm gonna pass these pieces around and you can take a look at them. First, I'm move that one forward. Uh, the next piece I have was a sample for of all things, a fireplace screen. The client was a dog lover and she wanted to see what it would really look like. And I said, well, I'm gonna make a small one first and see if you like it. But then I made this into two inch. This is three quarter stock. And then I made it for the fireplace screen in two inch by quarter stock. So you can imagine how large the dog head was at that point, there was one on each side of the screen. This I got a little inspiration from my oldest granddaughter. Uh, she thought, thought I should make a lady at one point. And I said, oh, all right, I'll try and make a lady. So <laughs> this is what I come up with. Um, it's a lady sitting, her hair is flowing in the back. She's got her arm, arms on her knees here. And this piece here is a piece that I've used for many years. I think I've been teaching for 10 years. I think I started 10 years ago uh, up at Touchstone. And then shortly thereafter, I started teaching one-on-one uh, -on -one classes at my studio in Bucks County. Um, this is just a, a couple pieces um, that, that have different ends on them, different things that you can do, um, a couple different leaves, a little flower that's kind of like a daffodil, but not. Um, it has stainless and mild steel on it and just shows a beginner student some simple things that they can do and take those simple elements and put it all together and it comes up to something that's fairly elegant. And lastly, but not least, this is one of my favorites. Um, I need more irises at home but I, I do have some and I decided that I was gonna try and make, make one one time. Uh, I never seen anybody else make one. So I thought, well, that's a good flower. Uh, about eight or nine years ago, I really got hooked on making flowers. Um, in fact, I was teaching several classes at Touchstone, floral, uh, floral works, a lot of vines and leaves and flowers and birds and frogs and things like that. But this has nine leaves on it, and there's three of each side kind, and uh, it takes quite a while to make one. Uh, it's been a good seller for me, um, so I'm glad I started making it. Um, pass that around. Uh, I 
my I used to do a lot of commission work. I've done large benches. I've done a 12 foot circle bench. Um, it was for a uh, wedding party to sit at at a uh, a state about a mile from my house. Um, and uh, that was a pretty interesting project. It took probably the most amount of time of any project that I made um, thus far. And I don't think I'm gonna make any big ones like that anymore. Made several gates, lots of railings. Um, but now that I'm older and retired, um, I really got into the teaching more than anything else. I teach, like I said, one-on-one one, one -on -one classes at my studio. And I found Peters Valley about four or five years ago. We were trying to figure out that the other day. Um, and I really like it here. I like how Peters Valley presents themselves, um, how they bring people together. Um, I think they're doing a really good job and I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, that's about it, as far as I know. Thank you so much, Wayne. Appreciate that. Okay. Next, we have in our fiber studio, we have Daryl Lancaster and our assistant who to introduce her is Celia Shaheen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Um, so Daryl is actually teaching, co-teaching this class with her daughter, Brianna. So I am going to read out both of their bios, the dynamic duo. <laughs> so uh, Daryl Lancaster is a hand weaver and fiber artist known for her award-winning hand-woven fabrics and garments, has been sewing and weaving for half a century. She gives lectures and workshops to guilds, conferences, and craft centers all over the United States. The former features editor for Handwoven Magazine, she frequently contributes to various weaving and sewing publications. Daryl maintains a blog at weaversew.com slash word blog, and with her daughter has created the YouTube channel, The Weaver Sews. And Brianna is Daryl's daughter. Um, she's been weaving since her legs could reach the treadles on the loom. Brianna has explored all areas of the fiber arts and has created many award-winning works. She was the fiber studio assistant at Peters Valley during the 2019 summer season. Um, and again, together they have created a YouTube channel called The Weaver Sews. So let's all give a warm welcome to Daryl Lancaster. It is so good to be here, especially after last year. Um, I also volunteered at the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey and for the first time last Tuesday, I was able to go to the costume shop and, you know, and hopefully they'll have their productions this summer outdoors. But it's like a very small sense of normal is returning to our lives. And um, it makes, it means a lot, you know, that I'm here this weekend. I start with this shirt because you know, and going through and culling through things. I found this shirt and this is um, 1988 Peters Valley Summer Crew. And that year they had all of the instructors. And I think this was pre all of this kind of technology. And I think we wrote our signatures out on a card and sent them in and somebody put them up on a thing. And so this is from 1988. That is, just, that's how long, and I might've even taught the year before that here how long I have been doing this and been to this valley and how much this valley has integrated. And as a matter of fact, Brianna was explaining to somebody that I was pregnant with her when I was on the board of directors here. So, you know, I, <laughs> and I actually came out here in 1975, four or five, when it was newly opened uh, on a field trip in college textiles. So, you know, I'm intimately attached to this place and I included that, but uh, let me just move quickly through some of my work because my story is just 50 years old. You, you don't need to hear it all here, but um, let's see. So I, I make clothing. That has always been my passion. I learned to sew when I was super young. My mom was a tailor and I, when I found the loom in college, because I have a degree in fine arts, it 
took a while to blend the two skills, but I ultimately found that the loom was a great way to get yet another raw material, to take raw materials, turn them into another raw material, and then have that to make a final product. Typically people weave things, rugs, bags, shawls, you know, something. I weave a raw material and I love that. And I love seeing then what I can do with that raw material. So this is some yardage, random yardage that I did in 2016, some more yardage that I did in 2017. Um, this was created out of these hand dyed skeins that I call dye mops. When you dye your own fabric, when you dye your own warps, there's always leftover dye and you just kind of soak up the dye with whatever. And you get these odd things. And the challenge is, what can I make with that? Um, this is in this piece is in the gallery and the faculty show. And I started out with this a, ba a basket of odd things. I prefer to look at what's in my raw material stash, put it together and say, okay, now what can I do from this? So these are some of the clothing that I have made from that. Everything here, um, I've hand dyed the warps or the yarn. So the middle one, all those yarns I've dyed myself. Um, the ones that flank on either side are hand painted warps. So the color moves in and out of it. Um, here's some more pieces. I hand dyed all the yarns in the tunic on the left and the middle tartan actually is in the current issue of Handwoven Magazine. I wrote a feature about using up your bits and pieces. So this was just all leftover stuff from other projects that I combined and made into this I call it tartan plaid. It's not a tartan, by the way. The silk twill, um, the third one in, that's all hand dyed silk yarn, and the swing coat um, on the right. So the one on the right and the one on the left, um, my daughter, when, when the pandemic hit and all of my teaching for the next two years was canceled, um, my, I had hired my daughter as a studio assistant and she, I immediately put her online and to learn things like Adobe Illustrator and and then Adobe Premiere. And so she spent that first beginning part of the spring of 2020 learning how to illustrate and then digitize all of the 12 garment patterns that I used in my workshops. So the ones flanking on either side are uh, my patterns that are available on my web shop that people can now download. So my goal, having done this for so much of my life, I don't know anything else, is to eventually fade out leave a digital legacy behind, let people help themselves and go on and learn all the things. You know, I want to learn this. I, you know, and it's been so great, I have to tell you with the pandemic because I listened to the lectures at Peters Valley. I've listened to lecturers with the America, uh, Hand Weavers Guild of America. And, and I, all of a sudden I'm excited. I want to try that. Oh, I want to try that. Weed, that would be so cool. I have a workshop, a digital workshop starting Wednesday that I'm taking that I'm actually taking a four week course in botanical printing, you know, and for the first time in my life, I see a future where I'm not on the road anymore and I can learn all those things. You know, it's kind of like I'm retiring. Is that a thing? Artists don't ever retire. They just kind of reinvent, they want, they fade into the night and they reinvent themselves. And anyway, so real quickly, you know, I would make a, a large, 10 yards of fabric and then I could make cool different things with it, you know, just until I used up all the fabric and then the scraps went into tote bags. Um, oh, I'm wearing the vest in the middle here. I forgot what was in the slides. Yeah, these are a couple of recent pieces. Um, occasionally Silk City Fiber, which is a supplier, will call me and say, we've got a new yarn. What can you do with it? Oh, that's really fun to give me really tight parameters and say, I've got this cone of yarn. What can I invent? Um, some more of my pieces. This is these are all hand dyed yarns, um, and these are uh, patterns of mine that I sell. Um, and then you know I do a lot with I like to do a lot with scraps and leftovers and things. And um, you know these were leftover warps that I just uh, made small whatever I could get out of it with whatever was in the basket. It's how I like to work and how I like to approach things. Um, and then back in uh, 2018, and then was released in 19, I did a series of videos for Threads Magazine. It's part of their subscription insider series. And you know, I've written for them a lot. And although Threads Magazine focuses on sewing and I'm sewing with hand wovens, um, I knew from that experience that I wanted to be able to leave a digital legacy 
of of my what's in my head so um in unrelated to all of this when my daughter moved back home with her five looms and animals um the we had 35 looms in the house it was uh, it was untenable I and mean, we had looms in every room and i got the idea to renovate the garage um it's a two and a half car garage i called a handyman in so we turned the basement into my sewing room and um ooh, Meg. <laughs> yeah, Meg Meg's working in the corner there and we turned the garage into my studio uh my uh all the looms so we've got 37 looms now two more came to live with us including a 60 inch one right in the front and so I've got more looms than God and more yarn than God's helper and, and more books and you know and I am just yeah, we're running out of book space. And every time I hear a lecture, I'm like, I don't have that book. <laughs> I go online and order it. Anyway, so um, I have available in my web shop, not that this is a sales pitch, but it was important to me to leave the things that I developed accessible to people to be able to help themselves. And then, um, you know, we developed this YouTube channel. And so we started September 11th. We, uh, except for Christmas and New Year's, which were on Fridays, every Friday we drop, another one dropped this morning while I was driving out here. And here is, um, you know, me on shoot. We have it set up. Brianna does all the, um, the she directs. We have two cameras, um, a separate sound system. She edits it all. She went online, learned how to use Adobe Premiere. She's amazing. She handwrites all the captioning. Yes, we are mother daughter. There are times we have knocked down drag out fights. It's hilarious. But because I write her paycheck, I always win. <laughs> Unless she's. <laughs> so anyway, um, that is, you know, I, I'm excited that, you know, the pandemic, I will say, was one of the greatest challenges of my life in that it forced me to go in a new direction that I could not be more excited about. So I'm teaching one more class here this summer, and that's in August, and I'm done. That's it. No more on the road. People want to come to my studio. That's fine. And, you know, I know, uh, like, you know, a couple, I know people that already booked for that for the fall. And I am looking forward to that. I love being home. I every time I walk in my studio, I just sit there and, you know, and smile because it's mine. And so I am looking forward to the future. I thank Peter Sally for all the years you know of opportunity and now i'm going to cry because that's like really stupid but you know it's been a long history here of, of the ability to to move my craft into a direction that um that gave me uh, opportunities and promise and uh, you know and so i am more than grateful and um i want to come back here as a student and take all the things <laughs> anyway thank you very much is thank you daryl i'm so sad to hear that news but yeah. really happy for you and you can always come visit <laughs> and she's leaving brianna behind, oh, yeah. behind. <laughs> okay next in our printmaking studio sashka ross and the assistant maggie seinfeld Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Rachel. You're okay. Very good. All right. So Sashka Ross is a mixed media artist who's been working in her practice for over 45 years. And she learned from Mitch Lyons, the master originator of this low tech but beautiful method of printmaking. And she has been working with this kind of media for years now. She is born in Canada, but has been lived in the U.S. for many years, and she received her MFA at the Cranbrook Academy of the Arts. And since the 1990s, she's worked with Peters Valley extensively and has worked in different studios and has been teaching here for a very long time. She's loved here. So without further ado, Sashka Ross. <laughs> Thank you very much, Megan. 
I am so glad to be standing here and seeing all of you and that we're all doing the things we love to do together, doing our work. And it's a really uh, exciting to be back in uh, a working environment and being able to teach, being able to chat, seeing everybody. So I'm gonna start, I have a 50 year history that I'm gonna avoid and start with a show I had at the end of the year of 2018 uh, at Peters Valley uh, Gallery, which was the beginning of this new period of work that um, I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, we live right across the um, Dingman's Bridge in uh, Dingman's Ferry, Pennsylvania, and spend six or seven months there. So I'm over here often. Actually, I'm waving this around. You can hear me fine? Yeah. So uh, I really am a big proponent of sketchbooks and doodles and keeping stuff. So the top left is a little one by two inch beginning of the Goblet series, which probably has 50 pieces in it now. Um, I spent about six months working in a very small apartment with uh, water media and tried to get the most out of I, most I could out of a single wall, which uh, this is a 90 inch piece by 22 inches. I love to have something to focus on in the distance and uh, it helps me uh, counteract the closeness of when I'm working always with something right in front of me. So the large spiral on the left is uh, 90 inches by 22. Um, nature and being outside affects me a lot. I love finding a moment where I can photograph something that is just such a surprise. So this looks like the Olympic torch, but it's steam coming off a building being caught in a beautiful uh, icy cold sunset. But I'm here to talk about clay monoprinting, so I should do that. Uh, start with water add tile six china clay. And uh, this happens to be Grawlig, I just learned at lunchtime. And uh, put it in till it um, becomes a thick slurry. And I work on a green leather hard slab and put marks in it. And then I'm going to be filling up these marks after the pattern sets with um, different colors. So I'm setting up a landscape here with the uh, foreground and then the midground and a uh, pink sky finishing. Uh, the imagery that is then put on is drawn first on newsprint, which is then rolled into the slab. So it's a buildup of many, many layers over a period of days or time or however long the piece takes. And um, I keep building up till I'm getting ready to print the um, image. And this is the Rime, the white sheet in the back, halfway through printing. And it's um, a non-woven synthetic substrate that is engineered to be an air conditioning filter paper. And that's why the pigments stick automatically to this background because of it being mixed with the tile six china clay dust. I use spoons and uh, rollers to print the image. So it's all hand done. Uh, that's adding the magenta layer. Uh, you can see in the background, the texture of a woven grid, but that's pre-printed by the manufacturers of the Rime. And that's the side I choose to print on. So things are um, individual pieces or monoprints and you can work in series, but can't get duplicates like a normally edition print. So these are about 21 by 21, uh, working with nuclei. Um, spreading exponentially. Having all this time during COVID has, as Daryl was saying, been really great for me to 
be in my studio, shut the door. The borders were closed in Panama where we spend the winter. So I was there for eight months last year. And uh, it's a really great balance to the anxiety and the complications and the unsureness of everything to just be in my studio. I love to make um, coil pinch pots and a large part of the enjoyment is working in group um, firing situations. So I've been able to do a few times here at Peters Valley and a couple of other onagamas and it's uh, really propelling for me. And the fluidity of that and the hand paper making, which is in my background works so well with the clay monoprinting because it's a fluid material. Um, this is a submerged pot and it's holding uh, future dreams and it's looking up to the sky. This is a three foot by four foot oil on canvas. Um, this is using a batik method of beeswax with watercolor on paper. This was furthering the DNA series. And I also am doing that on my pit fired pieces that are porous. So the watercolor is absorbed and then wax them. And the um, interior is oil paint and then it's wax, which is the nuclei related to the double spiral of the DNA. Uh, the DNA has propelled me a lot given our situation now and uh, genetics and hereditary things. And it's amazing what people are figuring out. Um, I have a wonderful leaf carrier and uh, wanted to do something, you know, a little lower key, but then the drapery started coming in and you never know what's behind the curtain. Uh, this is the piece that was in the Nuance show that was the beginning of the uh, DNA pieces. It's made out of uh, indigo dyed grass hearts and iris stalks with copper wire and shadow. The larger drawings are with fireplace charcoal and I use inks as well as the watercolor, but the brilliance of the color is from the uh, inks. So this is um, projected DNA three, which is dusty sage. And it's um, 45 by 60. Uh, this is projected DNA five, which is genetics and who is really watching. DNA two, you can see the uh, nuance piece on the left and then extended to the right. And it's um, about uh, stem cell research in Panama because the United States shut uh, all new projects down. So just grandfathered uh, projects were allowed to remain. So it's, uh, you know, who knows when that'll change, but it's huge to think of it being displaced and you know who, who knows what, but uh, this is a book jacket and it's called Found or Not in the Woods. And it opens from the inside in pairs to the outside. So you can see this split a little better in this piece. Um, needing air and then sitting focus. Uh, this is uh, just running like mad from who knows what's gonna be on you. Uh, showing that being uh, printed. Uh, the depth of the slab is about uh, 7 sixteenths and um, it can last for a long time if you keep it wet. So I'll keep it for the full time I'm away because I only do the clay monoprints when I'm away. So this is the last piece, it's um, called soundings and I'm using it in the maritime or nautical sense, um, needing to be aware of one's surroundings, the, the depth, the profundity, what's gonna happen because so much is unknown. And um, I'm really glad to have shown you my work and I hope everybody has a wonderful workshop this weekend.
Oh, Sash will be fine. It's tiny. <laughs> Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you very much, Sashka. Our next speaker tonight in the woodworking studio, we have Kate Hawes and our assistant, Kat Nash. Hello, I'm Kat Nash, and I am introducing Kate Hawes, who's teaching the Fearless Carving class in woodworking. Um, Kate is a custom furniture maker who has a certificate in furniture and cabinet making from the North Bennett Street School and completed a residency at Anderson Ranch Center Art Center. Um, uh, she splits her time between teaching and working in her shop in the Catskills, where she is inspired by the surrounding, surrounding woods and all that dwells in them. Welcome to the stage, Kate Hawes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. I don't really need to look at that, but um, yeah. Anyway, I'm really happy to be here. Um, it seems it's my first year um, and it feels like a gentle, loving place to me. And I feel very at home here, even though I've never been here. Probably because everyone's into making stuff and working with their hands and you know materials and you know all that stuff that makes me happy. So it feels like home in a way. So I'm just gonna go through. I just did. I didn't know what to do for this, but this is the way I organized it. It was just sort of highlights through my not 50 years yet, but 30 years, um, which to me seems like a really long time. Um, but yeah, like, and I think like part of like, you know, if you're going to stay in your craft for the long haul, you have to sort of like keep, I think someone said you reinvent yourself over and over again. The way I see it is similar is like, you have to learn how to sort of like fall in love with your medium again and again. Like you can sort of, it can grow stale. It can, you know, you have to like re-energize your commitment and your love for what you do. And so I think my little slideshow, I thought was sort of showing different periods maybe. So I began my training um, working for a furniture maker in Brooklyn and we did very high-end custom furniture. Everything was like to the 64ths of an inch, like very precise very technically challenging at least i thought so and then i went to north bennett um i made the the table on the right at north bennett it's veneer it's, it's very traditional um kind of techniques with like a uh, bricked round um like you make bricks of wood round circular um tabletop or the the apron for it and then veneered uh kind of a biedermeyer style um I was the way I, I mostly am just interested in how things are built. So I got really interested in that when I was in school. And then that's just a, I'm just showing these because this is like sort of the background I really come from. I was sort of trained in this like kind of make a reproduction, make like make it perfect. This was a, a job I had where the person had one chair that they bought at an auction and they wanted, I guess, four or five more. And that like made me crazy. It was really hard. Um, so it was like copying every little piece and like replicating it by hand. Um, so that was crazy, but it's technically very, uh, it keeps you on your toes. It's very interesting, but um, not really the kind of work I always wanted to stick with. Oh, maybe I go the other way. Oh, shoot. Maybe I did this wrong. Oh, I'm so sorry. I pressed the wrong. I I thought that was an arrow. Oh, you not, were close. I mean, it was like shaped like that. Okay. So like, okay. I mean, got it. Thank you. <laughs> Challenging. I'm challenged. Um. So this is like a design of a table I made. I was sort of like exploring like the use of color, which seemed really radical after my background. Um. And then like also like some sort of 
uh, sculpting on the legs. Um, and then got the arrow right. And then I, I made this because my shop mate said, like, what did he say? He gave me an assignment. I want, I was like, I just so sick of all this furniture I'm making. <laughs> you know, like he's like, make make a box that's not a box or something like that. Like, like we had this whole thing, and it's so corny, right? But I was like, okay, fine. So I made a sphere with um drawers in it. So that was kind of cool. I, I did, and that's that bricking technique I use in the first table with the round apron. So it was like, kind of like, so stuck in me to use these like old furniture techniques. This is like a very like old, hundreds of years old technique to brick it. And then I just shaped it by hand. So it's like, why don't you turn that on a lathe? And I'm like, I don't know. Cause it's like more fun just to like shave it. Um, and then the drawers make it kind of fun. They sort of go in at different directions. Um, oops, yeah, going too fast. Then I, and this is just a piece I made. Yeah, I was trying to get into like sculpture things, bigger things um, in a way. Um, this also is about sort of construction and like how do you put a big form together so that it holds together? And there's probably a gazillion ways to do that out of wood. Um, and so I was trying out a new, I, I guess sometimes I feel like my whole life and craft is like trying out new techniques to see like what wood can do. And when I get it, I kind of move on to the next one. It's sort of how, weirdly how it feels for me. So I was like, how can I make this big sculptural shape, this sort of bowl shape out of stick, little tiny sticks of cheap poplar? Um, so that's what I did. Um, that was at Anderson Ranch actually. And then this is just an experiment I did. Also, again, experimenting with how do I make a shape with bits of wood in a way that I've never done before. So I, I did sort of what, uh, riffing off of like a boat building technique where you epoxy, um, you know, and uh, to, to, it's a basically just like glue joints, epoxy joints that you use like wire to sort of twist the joint so that you don't have to clamp it because how the heck would you clamp something like that, the two pieces. Um, so that kind of opened up my mind a little. And then this is just um, small hand sculptures. I, I love the idea of little small hand sculptures that you can like just kind of like play with like at your whatever chair, just like sit there and touch them. They're very tactile. Um, the bricking is coming back again with some glue, like blue epoxy. And that actually was based on my arm. Like I measured the, um, my arm from my elbow to my wrist. So that's actually what that is. And then, um, I don't know, these are just shapes, shapes, more shapes, more like new techniques. That is carved, that's uh, glue joints. Um, this is uh, something um, I made somewhat recently. Actually, I moved up to the Catskills from the big city. And uh, I'm supposed to stand here, I realize. I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. I just realized. Um, so yeah, the, the, this was like a piece of like oak I found in the woods. So I, since moving to the big country, um, of the cat skills from the big city, I've realized that wood is everywhere and why don't I just use it? So I sometimes scavenge little bits when I'm walking in the woods. This is a piece of oak that started to rot with like some fungus, which gave it like blue and like this sort of like yellow. There's a crack, I patched it a little bit. And then of course, cause I'm a furniture maker, I had to put a drawer in it, which, you know, is like <laughs> some kind of tick that uh, we have for better or for worse <laughs> but um, that is like just another experiment again it's like a sculpture that hangs on the wall it, it's quite deep you can't really see it in this it would have been better if it was a three-quarter view but it comes out like four inches so it, it was just sort of the idea of like a cloud like a very geometric simplified um three intersecting circles that's all really um this is something I uh, worked on for quite a long time. I would just add pieces to it and then let it sit in the corner. And I'm still not sure it's done, honestly. 
um you could tell me i don't know if it's done but it's it's actually made out of like pine which you know for furniture makers is kind of like more of a construction wood maybe not you wouldn't use so much for fine furniture but to me i really like pine i kind of love working with it um and i uh, again wanting to sort of push myself to try a different way of putting wood together and so it's it's making a i wanted to make a line like this out of wood and i didn't want to bend it I, it's quite structurally strong this thing each joint has a um did i give yeah there's a detail each joint has a tenon in it um and then it's all hand shaped with no like with spoke shaves but um yeah so and it was very i think also uh i've started to get into like the i've moved away from at least in my fun work not my work work moving into like how can i work improvisationally so that i can just like keep adding a piece on and sort of let it evolve rather than like here's a you know full scale shop drawing and go make that um i kind of burnt out on that and so i'm enjoying like having the freedom to just like add something on um and work uh without so much of a plan a, va a vague idea maybe a sketch but not like a clear plan and then i got into bowls um partly because i was up in the country and i was like finding all this wood and i'd never done it before so i've gotten really into like my bowl carving this is pear wood that i um found up there got you know sourced and um yeah i mean i'm experimenting with like carving wood that's not kiln dried not bought at the lumber yard so it's like uh it moves around it has different properties that you get to know when you work with it, which is super fun. And also, you know, you don't really get like thick pear at the lumber yard. You pretty much wouldn't even find pear. So um, you get to like work with really fun, interesting woods. Um, and then another bowl, which is uh, actually that was from um, a scrap from somebody, but it's Clara Walnut. And I guess I'm getting kind of into these like strange shapes like this one. I feel like is somewhat of a normal bowl, but it has this like spout on it. And I'm not sure why I did that, but um, I felt like it needed a spout. And, you know, it's a little, I like things that are a little mysterious, like, but I don't know, I'm not sure. This is a, this is a small box, another, it's almost like those little hand sculptures. It's just really a playful thing that you could like, sort of explore with your hands take it apart it comes apart um very tactile you know wood is very tactile it's you know you can it's very smooth with milk paint on it um and then a little carved little knob so that you can like pull it apart um fun this is my fun stuff and then this is um another bowl that i made with uh red paint and um you know getting into like maybe leaving the chisel marks and the gouge marks and saying, do I really have to sand all the time? <laughs> do we really need sandpaper in our lives? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm on a journey and I'm, I'm experimenting. I don't know the answer to that question. If you're making kitchen cabinets or people's dining tables, you probably need to sand a lot. You do, because you definitely do. But so I'm like, I enjoy not sanding when I, I do my own work. So this is a sanded bowl, that said, um, <laughs> that said, um, I wasn't good enough with my, with my gouges when I made this one. So you have to be pretty good with the gouges to be able to achieve, unlike say ceramics, I suppose you could create texture with your fingers with wood, it's really your cutting. And so you got to sharpen constantly. You got to be good with those gouges. It doesn't always work out. An elm is really rock hard. This is actually from an elm tree from Prospect Park. And, you know, with the elm blade, it's the prized material there that you're looking at. <laughs> um, elms are nearly extinct. Not quite, though. Um, 
this is just another walnut bowl. Um, we're like odd little stretch shapes. Um, and then, you know, I decided why not, you know, this one came out as a fish that's apple wood um, that I found. And I, you know, sometimes I just start carving and I don't know where I'm going. And I, I did that today with my students and they were very open-minded about that. Um, and, um, you know, there's a feeling of like, sort of like finding what it is that the wood wants to become, which is definitely a thing because this one, I saw that little eye with a knot and I was shaping it and it just, it just became a fish, it just became a fish. And then that became an owl. So, you know, you can decide if I've gone downhill or uphill since the beginning, but no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> now I'm calling carving owls and fish, but honestly, I feel like I'm more who I really am quite honestly. And in the end, I feel like that's, kind of what matters is that you car you make what you want to see and you know you make what makes you happy and sometimes like in the beginning of my career I felt like I had to make the things that the dudes around me were making so that I could make money and be like respected um, and so it took me a while to sort of like step back and say but what actually makes me happy and you know, carving fish and owls is quite fun for me. And then, or odd little shapes like that. So this is my, this is my little journey. So we'll see what happens next. I'm really happy to be here um, with you guys because this feels like such a creative place and there's so much good energy and I can't wait to like, hopefully have, to have the time to visit all of your studios and see what's going on in them. Yeah, so thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Kate. Next, we in the Fine Metal Studio. I'm wearing her evening, her um, earrings this evening. Sorry, Elizabeth Tokely. And our assistant is Maddie Meyer. All righty. Hi, everybody. So I'm Maddie Meyer. I'm the assistant in Fine Metals. And I'm going to be introducing Beth Ann Tokely. So Beth Ann is a graduate of Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. She's the founder of Eat Metal Art Jewelry Gallery and Metal Studio. Beth Ann has been an instructor for over 18 years and is currently teaching the intro to jewelry class um, at Peters Valley. Um, and her artistic approach is through math and nature. She loves to break down the raw beauty of nature into simple elements. So everybody. <laughs> So everybody give me or help me in giving a warm welcome to Beth Ann. Can I just put it there? So where's my here? Please hit that button right there. Okay. All right. So I'm actually gonna kind of start um, at Cranbrook. All right. So um um, at Cranbrook, I was interested in math and nature, and um, I realized that geometry and nature kind of went hands in hand. Um, this is a sketch I did. It's, um, it's called um, Circle, or it's all about a circle, and it's uh, found objects, uh, fabricated uh, metal, and uh, paper and wood. Um, and while I was um, studying math and nature, I kind of started um, investigating armillary spheres and uh, celestial globes. So armillaries were models that represented longitude and latitude and um, globes were maps of the constellations. So this is a, a timepiece, it's etched copper, it's um, hydraulic pressed um, spheres and it's um, fabricated and pierced and sawed. Um, when I began viewing um, nature, um, I started looking at it as really just simple uh, geometric forms. And, um, and I started to understand that both um, math and nature seemed important in understanding art. 
Um, this piece is from a series of objects that I call synthesis. And um, the title of it's called uh, Skeletal Cuboctahedron. And I wanted to make a collection of objects that represented a uh, fictional evolution or a family tree of simple geometric forms. Um, this is patinaed copper and bronze. Okay, so this is a wall piece from the same uh, series synthesis. Um, it's a cube octahedron and it's a hollow form construction uh, made of brass. So um, the two pieces that I just showed are the heads of the family tree or the evolution. And uh, this is the installation of the collection um, in its entirety. So it's all these little tiny objects. Um, and the uh, collection is called Synthesis. Um, so using the shapes in the series, um, I like to create um, fine art jewelry. So here in this, you see um, a detailed shot of some of those um, objects. And then this is a pair of earrings um, that was kind of uh, based on the forms. And uh, the collection that I started to make was called Air. Um, this is a statement piece. Um, it's called Continuous Tetrid uh, Circlet Necklace. Um, and it's from a collection called Infinite Energy. And uh, this is patinaed sterling silver with 18 karat gold pins. Um, it's made of seven different units, um, four different, um, uh, four different uh, circlets, and um, there's three different sizes. Um, so the collections create an evolution of a simple shape um, into sophisticated motifs or patterns, um, but they're also viewed in their own simplicity and, and they're valued for just being one in its own. Um, so each collection has um, limited edition pieces, and then there's also these one of a kind pieces within the collections. Um, so this piece is forged, and so the metal moves from like thin to thick on different planes. Um, it has uh, fancy colored briolette gemstones um, in a graduated size. Um, so this is um, a statement piece and this is from uh, collection elements. Um, so it uses simple lines and multiples uh, to create um, different uh, repeated patterns. Um, and then these are cufflinks from the collection um, elements and they're sterling silver. So when I was working with these hard geometric forms, I was very interested in seeing how they would react um, if they were built at a chain now. So I did a series of geometric shapes to see how soft and pliable um, the objects would become. This is called anamorph cuboctahedron. It's made of nickel silver. Um, I used the patterns from that series to create a collection called Rings of Pattern. And this is um, a Japanese hexagonal uh, pattern collar and it's about 1200 rings. Um, so I studied techniques from Japan and old English chainmail um, patterns to make the collection. So this is open round chainmail, idiot's delight, and uh, it's also called uh, round chainmail. Um, these are love you tags. They're based on geometry found in constellations. Um, so I was invited to participate in the MJSA mystery box design challenge. So in this challenge, you would receive a box of materials and within 30 days, you had to complete a piece. So the materials inspired me to look at vintage styled uh, layered chains. Um, layered chains were found in Victorian um, jewelry as well as Egyptian work. So I used forms from a few collections. I incorporated chains from uh, the rings of pattern. And then I used the single links from the elements collection. Um, and then I did um, these stacked gemstones. Um, uh, I also created the single link within that and also the connectors for the chains. And then um, the piece, um, so this piece hangs in the front and the back. And um, the piece in the back is not a gemstone. It's actually a piece of titanium that's colored that was found in the box. 
So after I designed the piece for the challenge, I started making these stacked necklaces using rose cut gemstones and incorporating my forged single link into the stacks. Um, I opened Deep Metal Art Jewelry Gallery in Hoboken in 2008, and it was a small gallery and a school and a place where I worked. Um, so that's a broader view of the space. Um, I was curating shows on a quarterly basis. One of the first shows I did was called Everyday Earrings. It was based on the idea that everybody's perception of everyday jewelry is very different. So um, it was inspired by a client of mine. She purchased this pair of earrings. And for me, they were really large and bold. Um, and each time I saw her, she would tell me how um, she wore them every day. And it seemed very kind of odd to me. And it started to make me think about people and their differences. Um, and so I had over about 100 pairs of earrings and 20 artists participated. Um, I also do um, commissioned work. And so this is a, a one of a kind uh, piece of jewelry um, that I did for a nonprofit organization. Um, so we took this print and we turned it into a pendant and it's 14 karat gold. Um, I also design engagement rings. Um, I do heirloom redesigns. So this is probably um, the most rings I ever combined into one piece. Um, it's made of seven rings. It's her grandmother's, her mother's, and her own engagement ring. And then it's a couple of anniversary bands as well. And it's titled The Circle of Life. Um, so at this point, the gallery's really not doing too many shows. It was really difficult to like continue to teach and make and, and, and do the shows. So that's kind of slowed down. Um, I'm currently focusing on making new work. Um, this piece is called Shield from Evil. It's um, emerald, sapphires, 14 karat gold, and patinaed silver. Um, so uh, the back of the piece is a piercing and sawing of a Japanese hemp pattern. The Japanese hemp pattern was used to wish children to grow healthy. Um, it was a sign of uh, protection from evil spirits. Um, um, this pattern connected to me with um, the collection that I started called Air that I really kind of never finished. Um, so I was actually invited to participate in, in the New York Fashion Week um, 2021. Um, and this is where the collection was presented. So um, I collaborated with uh, several fashion designers at the show. Um, this piece is emerald and it has that stacked bar um, with a single link inside of it. Um, so a reoccurring theme in my work is taking patterns and kind of dissecting them and then creating new patterns out of them. So um, this is the chandelier, chandelier necklace on the model. Um, and this was kind of influenced by that Victorian jewelry. It's made of brass and a diamond shaped um, lemon citrine. Um, and then that just drops. And then her earrings are actually pierced and sawed brass as well. Um, so I also continue to uh, join forms from existing collections to make new collections. So here you kind of have that bar form that I used in the elements collection, and then it has perched on top of it that diamond shaped lemon citrine. Um, and then um, this piece, um, so this piece is using that kind of simple uh, diamond shape and creating a new pattern within that. Um, this one's 14 karat gold um, patinaed sterling silver. And um, that's just a, a little bit of the, you know, the collection. And uh, I kind of always just kind of like to end on my kids. Thank you, Beth Ann. Our final instructor for this evening in the ceramic studio, we have Stuart Gare and the assistant is Grace Kerr. Hello, my name is Grace. I'm a ceramic um, assistant. And today I'm going to introduce Stuart Gear. Stuart Gear is from Aspen, Colorado. He went to Ohio University to study history. 
and graduated MFA ceramics at University of Nebraska in years of 2016. Um, Stuart taught at Harvard University before, and now he teaching ceramics at Colorado Mountain College. Stuart has his um, article pub, um, published at Ceramic Monthly Magazine in subject of soda firing each month. So that's uh, welcome, Stuart. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Stuart Gare. Uh, thanks for coming out. And thank you, Peters Valley and Bruce Dennert for bringing me here. I've always heard really great things and it's cool to actually be here. So thanks. Um, I'd actually like to start by telling you a little story about how and why I got into ceramics in the first place. And this was an experience that had a huge impact on me at the time and has continued to play kind of a perpetual role throughout my studio outlook today. Um, so in college, like Grace mentioned, I was a history major. And uh, at the time I had taken two ceramics classes and I was looking for a summer job, preferably something that had to do with history. And I came across a pretty unique opportunity at a historical reenactment village called Hale Farm. And uh, it looked a lot like this place uh, in a really weird way. So I had to include it in the show tonight. Um, but the job, the job, there was no job description. There was just a job title, which was for a historical interpreter slash potter. And I had no idea what that meant, but I was a history major and I had taken a couple of ceramics classes. So I figured, why not? And to my astonishment, I got a call the next day saying, uh, our, our guy left, you're hired, can you come in as soon as possible? So, um, so I headed in and I vividly remember walking into this room and they started like fitting me for my historically accurate clothing. And that's about the time my boss walked in and she started going over what it was that I was actually going to be doing. And she explained that I was to make a series of historically accurate wares for the gift shop, dig and process all my own clay from a nearby riverbed, fire a fairly large salt kiln and explain to hundreds of visitors each day what it was that I was doing and what life was like for Potter in early 19th century rural America. So as you can imagine, this was a lot for me to handle at the time, but I really enjoyed uh, what I was learning and more importantly, how I was learning it. Um, I liked studying a civilization through the pots they made. So it kind of got me thinking and I, I applied to post-baccalaureate programs all over the country and ended up getting into uh, the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, which is also where I ended up going to graduate school. Um, I had never been to that part of the country. So when I got over there, I immediately went down and explored the Southwest and was really drawn to the highlighted and shadowed areas, uh, the color and the blended and seamless variation and highlighted striations, natural divisions, um, how lines move over things and how an edge can create a shadow and how those lines can accentuate the topography of the land underneath. Um, it was also on this trip that I went to one of my favorite all-time museums, the Mesa Verde Museum, which houses a lot of Anasazi pots. And I was just really, just immediately drawn to the volume and the subtleties of, of how it was made, um, the utility of it and the balance. And I just love this diagram that depicts uh, how the Anasazis referenced uh, the gourd, a vital part of their culture through these pots. And it kind of like elevated the pots for me. And I feel like that's kind of something, it's the kind of thing I feel like I'll always be searching for and in, in what I make. So here's some of the pots I made during my time in graduate school in Nebraska. I was thinking of about pairing pieces together. And I, you know, I was looking at those Anasazi pots and thinking a lot about like buoyancy and this feeling of inflation in the pots and um, and how I could I started soda firing too and uh, and I was thinking about how I could 
use the soda fire to kind of accentuate those bulbous voluminous forms. Uh, I also really wanted to make a piece where I responded to the process itself. So I made a series of these, uh, these plates and I filled entire kilns with plates. And as soon as they were, as soon as the kiln came out, I like reoriented them on the wall and you could kind of see that natural gradation that was in the firing. And it also served as kind of a map for me to understand what was really going on in the kiln. Um, I spent a few years in Montana where I went to, where I was a resident artist at the Archie Bray Foundation. And when I got there, I immediately started changing the shapes. Uh, once I threw them, I, I spent just as much time uh, hand building them. And, and um, I was thinking a lot about edges and how an edge on a pot could naturally shield another part of the pot in the kiln, kind of like the shadow on the rock. I began digging a lot of my own materials again during this time. And I was also thinking a lot about how flame path moved over an edge versus a rounded surface, which seems really simple, but not, not really to me. Um, and, and I went, I spent a year at Harvard University. This is a picture of the front of their gorgeous studio. And I just wanted to show you this uh, to point out the, the glass walled room on the right is the gallery, which I'll bring up in a sec. Uh, right when I got, they had incredible resources. And right when I got there, I started doing a lot of testing. And I was in search of a glaze that would respond to the flame, kind of like the slips I was using. And after a lot of testing, I found one that was working and I bring this up because this is something I'm currently thinking about a lot in my studio practice. There's a detail. Uh, so I was fortunate enough to be part of a like a live exhibition called Hand Code Makers in Proximity. And uh, basically uh, me and a colleague, Jeff Boris, were given that front studio space to just work. And there were no parameters to it, which was amazing. Other than that, people could come up, come up off the street and ask questions or interact. So it was kind of like, kind of like a zoo vibe sometimes. But um, but uh, I was throwing on one side and he was three D printing on the other. And there, again, no parameters. But it didn't take long for us to put a table between us and start collaborating. Something I haven't done much of. Um, and so here are some of the pieces we collaborated on and I loved this project. It was three months long and uh, it forced me out of my comfort zone, um, forced me to think a lot about relationship. I learned a lot about um, 3D printing and, um, and you know, a bit, it was tough to like think about how to fire these pieces and how the pieces would relate. I, it was one of the things we started focusing on was like the, the lines of the 3D printer versus like the lines of a thrown pot, the lines of a trimmed pot and how those relate. So uh, that's something that, you know, we've been talking about continuing this and um, I'm excited to keep doing that. And also nothing was utilitarian, which was totally out of my comfort zone. Um, another detail. So living in Boston, I was uh, surrounded by art, which I loved, um, uh, whether it was in museums, galleries, public art. Uh, but I found that what I was most mostly drawn to were the simplest things. Again, thinking of things like light and shadow, uh, edge and relationship, uh, scale, curve. You know, also surround, being surrounded by that kind of architecture, as well as going to a museum like the MFA and seeing their pottery collection or their, you know, I really like these like Bauhaus era sets. Um, so, so right now I'm living in Colorado and I have all this kind of information and it, it's felt really fast um, and trying to, um, uh, it's just been nice to slow down and kind of take take in the, those inspirations and, 
and make work. Um, and I've been exploring soda firing and different techniques of that. And I'm excited to share, share my knowledge with my great students. And uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you to all of the instructors who shared their work with us this evening. Um, that concludes tonight's presentations. Thank you so much for being here, whether you are here in person or wherever you are. Um, that concludes tonight. Please enjoy your evening. I hope you enjoy the rest of your workshop. If you need anything, just let the office know. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.